Hi, everybody. Here we are back at Menla, in front of the Medicine Buddha, who's the namesake Menla is Medicine Buddha in Tibetan. And we are in the middle of realistic speech. Remember, realistic speech is the third uh, branch of the Eightfold Path, uh, third fold of the Eightfold Path. And uh, it is the beginning of ethics because speech is where we interconnect with other people, both listening and speaking. And uh, it's where we become a, a group entity, actually. Instead of individual animals fighting for subsistence, one eating another, but although mammals have this one ambiguity of taking life within the body of the male, of the female, of the mammal, rather than just the egg left on the sand. <laughs> and uh, so the human, though, is fully interconnecting, though, with other minds by speech by listening, hearing, remembering, and also recording for the future, and, uh, and listening to thoughts and speech from the past in texts and things. So it's amazing, you know, the, our human species. We are amazing, and because of that, we can figure out how to interconnect with everybody. And therefore, speech, in a way, is our blissful interconnection with everybody. Speech is the one that turns into the Sambhogakaya, it's a totally enjoyable body of the infinite body of a Buddha. You know, not the reality body and not the emanation body where they emanate into being individuated uh, embodiments and the reality one where you are everything equally, but the one in between where you enjoy being, A, being available through emanation and being interconnected completely through reality. And that's your samboga. And sam boga. Boga means to enjoy totally, and sam means altogether enjoying. That's really nice, isn't it? Bliss, that is, super bliss. Words shape our thoughts. I think that's the one we were at. After the verse, one of the few verses I remember in my Tibetan. Zeba kunle tsungini, zeba chogyen deyani, dini yinsu kebayi, of the Buddha's many deeds, their deeds of speech are the supreme. For this very reason, the wise applaud the Buddhas for their speech. Translating, because when you're a Buddha and you are the other people that you're talking to, your speech is your bridge, expressing your feeling of finding the bliss in them somewhere deep in their miserable embodiment Deep in there is that sense of connection to reality, that every being has reality, then being bliss, okay? Just to get to the, touch on the nub of things before we go into detail. So, there, so words do shape our thoughts. In the most high-tech, advanced, esoteric ways, speech actually controls how we shape our bodies and minds, even bodies as well as minds. Speech, that's, a, that's from the esoteric level where the subtle mind is so powerful, and it's through instincts our body gets shaped by our instincts that we bring from previous lives. And like we have hands and fingers to reach out and hold another's hand and interconnect with them and to in, in, internalize in them, you know, and there we have these. So then there are wish to interconnect with others that for, then causes us to elaborate limbs and things. In that sense, at the deep sort of biological level, speech shapes our bodies. And in this, and the biological level is touched on, of course, in the esoteric, where you get into consciously being your own neurology. You consciously are your own neuroscience and your own neuroemotion and your own neurointerconnection. It's wonderful. So speech at its most poetic, poesia, you know, from coming from to be creative, language when it is creative. And so that's like a mantra is the most poetic. But anyway, speech at its most poetic and powerful becomes a mantra. Oh, I say that. Becomes a mantra when it liberates the mind. Vajradhara Buddha made this famous statement in the esoteric community, Tantra. You should create your mind with your body form, uh, mind with your body form, and your body with your mind form, and you shape your mind's form with your inner formulations of your words. How interesting. That's a, I forget the Tibetan and Sanskrit of that, but I should remember anyway, I will. Following that principle, 
We use words to shape our thoughts and our thoughts to shape the physical instruments of our experience. It is thus no wonder that the super education in ethics begins with the cultivation of wakeful, realistic speech. Because this is ethics because it involves others, speech does. Whether we don't, whether we're all alone in a room, the words that we think in, if we think in words, if we have an inner monologue or inner dialogue sometimes, if we have several different attitudes in our mind and different, if we're worrying and doubting and inquiring and analyzing something, we have several different sort of, uh, you know, subjectivity structures in our mind. And so we, we debate within our own mind. But when we do that, uh, we, with speech, we are using things that are developed by interconnecting with others and from others in the past before we were even born in this life and which we created these shapes of structure which are formed, which end up as words where through some, through the medium of this kind of conceptual verbal structure, we mediate our perceptions and our experiences and so on. So it is thus no wonder that the supereducation in ethics, because there we're interconnected with others in some way, begins with the cultivation of wakeful, realistic speech. You can be ethical in regard to yourself, actually. You can treat yourself badly and harm yourself, or you can be good to yourself and treat yourself well and be beneficial to yourself. Sometimes being beneficial to yourself might cause making yourself a little stress or pain. Like if you have to pull out a thorn with a tweezer, you have to, or a pip, you know, you have to, sort of go in and make a bigger wound to get the thorn out. For example, if it has a little hook, like a porcupine quill, has a little hook on it, you have to make more wound to yourself. So it's always contextual what is helpful and what is harmful. Speech is, of course, the place where we transcend isolated individuality and live in community with others, as words are shared between minds and meanings are shared between cultures. To emphasize, when we listen, we open to others' minds. When we speak, we are admitted into others' minds. Speech exists inside us, outside us, in between, inside and outside, and beyond all such dualities. <laughs> this shared community is not a new condition of Westerners. In the noble teaching of Vimalakirti Sutra, when Shariputra, the ancient Indian saint and foremost individual vehicle, that's the dualistic vehicle, disciple of the Buddha, is asked by the wisdom goddess to tell her how long he has been in what he thinks is his privately attained nirvana state. That's why it's dualistic, because people in that school have an ideology of thinking that nirvana is somewhere outside of the relational world, because they find that they have assumed and they, or they perceive and they feel that the relational world is purely miserable even when you have pleasure in it because it won't last and because it's not as good as it could be. It's not pleasure, really. It's, it's called the suffering of change. So they think it's just so definite about that that they think that a, a, a place of pure bliss would have to be outside of this world. So that's why they have the dualism of nirvana and samsara being in two different places. He doesn't answer. You know, he implies to her, she says, well, I've been here. He asked her, I remember what it is. He asked her, how long have you been in this house? Because she suddenly appeared. She was like invisible. She was like Cortana in the halo se sequence. You know, she was a being that could just manifest the body or not manifest the body. She was one with the infinite energy of the subtle, in, you, you know, transparent light, the transparent energy and transparent matter. So he says, well, how long have you been in the house? And then she says, well, how long have you been in nirvana? Because she knows he thinks he attained nirvana, a temporary one, but will go back there after he gets rid of his body. And he's only back because the body has kind of momentum, you know, like residual momentum it has. Digital residual self-image only exists, but really he's already he's gone into the infinite, he thinks. <laughs> and then he's silent, right? So then he does, so he's silent and he doesn't answer but keeps silent. Looks very meaningful but doesn't say anything. She asks him, why, venerable elder, speaking very respectfully but critically, you are known as foremost of the wise. Why do you not speak? Now when it is your turn in our conversation, you do not answer my question. 
Shariputra says, since nirvana is inexpressible goddess, I do not know what to say. He tries to make it humble. Not that he's higher, that he's in, he actually, his reality is the infinite he feels. And he's only, the digital residual self-image, he's only there. You know, that's a term from the Matrix, a brilliant term by the most brilliant people who made it. He said, because your digital self-image is just here, but really I'm beyond here, I'm not here. So therefore I don't know what to say, but then that's inexpressible that that could be so. And so I don't know what to say. And then she says, she then respects the usefulness of that silence in this case by saying respectfully but firmly, Venerable Shariputra, all the syllables pronounced by the elder have the nature of nirvana. So if anything, you blah, 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 you would say they have the nature of nirvana. Why? Nirvana is neither internal nor external, nor can it be apprehended apart from them. Okay, that means nirvana is not just this relative by itself, nor is it something outside of this, nor can it be handed anything, in any way apart from all of this. And yet it can be nirvana as well as that it seems to be samsara. Therefore, Reverend Shariputra, do not point to nirvana by abandoning speech. Why? The holy nirvana is the equality of all things. <laughs> Meaning, there's a way of being here in the relative while yet not, not being in nirvana. And actually, you are like that, Sariputra. It's just that you're assuming somehow that you're in this body, that it's a leftover thing. It's a remainder. You, you actually are, you have, you have achieved a sense of oneness with the infinite in which there was no content, so you thought it was a different place. And so you know you're really there, and you're unreally here. But you think that unreal place and the real place are different. Whereas when this is the real place, you're here but completely free here. But she doesn't quite make it so elaborate as that. She just says it like that. And, but he, and he kind of then, because in a way, he's already non-dual. But somehow he has this residual mind thing that, they, that this non, the way of being in the non-dual is dualistic. You get it? So he's been he taught the Lotus Sutra vision by Buddha. He's the great student of Buddha. He's been taught that, that this is all not suffering. It's perfect. It's beautiful. It's the golden body of Buddha right now, where we are. It's gold. Body exposed in the golden wind was the expression of one of the great Zen masters where they said, what is it like when you finally, when the tree withers and the leaves fall and the tree withers? It's a famous koan in Zen Buddhism. What is it like, speaking to an enlightened Roshi master, supposedly, in China, Chan master, says, what is it like when the tree withers and the leaves fall? And he says, body exposed in the golden wind. <laughs> Isn't that great? I love it. <clears throat> in Tom Cleary's translation, that is. Therefore, Reverend Shariputra, do not point to nirvana as if it were somewhere else by abandoning speech. Why? The holy nirvana, so this is holy, being here is holy. When you know that this is holiness, right here, is the equality of all things. This is why realistic speech, the beginning of the super education in ethics, is actually the guiding energy of all education in non-duality. Wow. Which also transcends the duality between the pair Duality and non-duality, not by merely avoiding duality through a dualistic silence. <laughs> Good. Then, then a heading, speech as essential to learning, the mainspring of wakeful ethics. One reason why many Western teachers and practitioners of Buddhism shy away from understanding the three super educations in ethics, mind, and wisdom that constitute the Dharma in practice. Okay, get that. This corresponds to the Dharma as a text, where you have Vinaya, you have Sutra, and you have Abhidharma. So the Vinaya literature is the ethical literature. It's thought of as like the monk's rules, but it's also laypersons' rules. 
So it's it's a, it's kind of the way of way of being, way of living, way of interacting. That's ethics, and that's with the Vinaya. And there's, so, for example, in the Vinaya, is where Buddha's biography is told, because he sets an example by being a mendicant, the, the head mendicant, you know, by giving himself in various ways, in that way. Mind is meditation and understanding and developing a higher power of mind and it's psychology and it's really knowing you're living, in, inhabiting your own subtle mind and your subtle body and being your own neuroscientist and so forth. So it goes really deep. And from, it's tantra from the beginning, actually, already, without even mentioning, even though it says, well, we're still dualistic, but subtly it's teaching even tantra. And actually, it's you know, teaching even tantra we, in, our, in our history. And then wisdom, abhidhamma, is not a fixed set of things, but it is a collection of things from everywhere where Buddha said, which are like scientific type of things, which provoke analysis of the nature of reality, which is where the analysis becomes really strong, like a scientist, where you don't have any dogmas, you're completely open-minded, but you observe everything down to the subatomic and non-atomic, even pure energy detail. Okay, and also the infinity de detail. <laughs> Right? Because we're all in infinity, right? Because infinity, the opposite of finitude, infinity cannot be excluded from all finitude, or it wouldn't be infinite, right? If it wasn't one with it, any kind of finitude. You get it? That's the way duality, that's the way you hold duality very nicely. Okay, anyway. Very good. So, so the three super educations are what what, the, what all those texts cultivate in being, where speech becomes their teacher through texts, okay? The three baskets, or the three sets of texts, and the three super educations, educating your behavior of mind, behavior of mind, and speech and body, not just your body, educating your inner, occupying of every subtle dimension of your mind, coarse and subtle dimension of your mind, through learning meditation and self-awareness and, and even analysis that we don't normally think of as education, as meditation. And then wisdom is everything, investigating of everything, scientific experiencing the nature of reality, all of it. And that's what wisdom leads us to do, that super education. So it's like a curriculum, right? Uh, so ethics is in the gym, mind is in the psychology department, social sciences and psychology, and wisdom is the natural science department as a curriculum. And that constitute the dharma in practice. And dharma also means teaching of a practice and the practicing of the practice, that means both. Referring to them as the three trainings sometimes is that we've all been educated, oh yeah, as the three trainings, is that they've all, oh yeah, constitute dharma in practice. Oh yeah, I'll say one reason why, I'm sorry, I jumped into the middle of a sentence. One reason why many Western teachers and practitioners of Buddhism shy away from understanding the three super educations in ethics, mind, and wisdom that constitute the dharma in practice, the realizational dharma, the experiential dharma, Referring to them as the three trainings, right? Is that that's all they they say? They call them the three trainings. Adi Shiksha doesn't just mean training. Shiksha means education. Adi Shiksha means intense education, super education. Adi, it means repeated. It means transcending higher. Adi, intensify, intense. It means, and so intense education. Adi Shiksha is that we've all been educated a lot already. So we think we're all fully educated. We graduate college, even graduate school, you know, and 12 years of pre preliminaries, and middle school, elementary school. And so we think we're really educated. And so why would we need more educating? But we don't mind training, because <laughs> it leads intact our sense of beings. We are so well educated, but actually we are poorly educated. We would have no education in ethics because, because we are in a culture that is utterly unethical. It's just whatever you can get away with is ethics. Look at the, our presidential candidate. That's his ethic, is whatever he can get away with. That's, that's a wild savage. He does whatever they can get away with. That's an animal. He gets to eat whatever's in front of you, whoever's in front of you. Okay? So 
that's not we're uneducated in ethics. Actually, we think ethics is just a you know a, a choice, and the, the, those who choose the good things are just maybe wimps, so that kind of savage person thinks you know, who's actually the product of our education system, <laughs> in the in the rawest form you know, and then. Uh, and then meditation, we don't learn to meditate. Yes. We just uh, pump information in our thing from our classes. And then we think we're really smart from the beginning. If we're born in the upper classes, you know, we think we have high SAT score and IQ and blah, blah. Or we think we're stupid and we can't be educated in mind. We can't concentrate and we're just distracted by everything. We're brainwashed by television and whatever. And in wisdom, we think we can't understand reality. We accept that we're told that you can't. So what are we learning? Oh, we're just learning how to be productive, how to do press this button or that, you know, make this kind of money or that kind of money, cook this burger or that burger, kill this animal or that animal. We're not with skills, but we're not educated of what reality is because we're taught you can know reality. So what kind of culture do we have? The terrible, actually. We're lower. We're backward. We're worse than nice tribe that at least they all get stoned together. They all t read each other's minds, and then they go on the hunt, and then they have a little bit of harmony in the village, in their tents or their Sorry, teepees. I'm still not sure about that. So we're not even that good. We live all isolated in little apartments. Never mind. And we live all isolated in little apartments. We don't know any neighbor, and we barely can maintain a family. We get divorced, etc. We're alienated with our children or parents. What kind of culture do we live in? And we're wrecking the planet that we live in. So we're fouling our nest. So we're going to break. Let's make a decent curriculum. That's what wisdom is bliss wants us to do. Not a religious thing at all. It means become an educated person. Many of us has gone through eight years of primary, four years of secondary, four of higher, and three to seven of professional education. And yet we're still anxious, insecure, volatile, and often depressed. Isn't that so? Our education in Euro-American culture has not solved our problems of suffering. But that is not the fault of edu education per se, and the speech it depends upon. It is the fault that we have yet to become properly educated to use speech to transform our minds. Because why? Because our culture was educated religiously under an inquisition, at least in some kind of ethic, reinforced by the idea of an omnipotent authority, and in some kind of mind by going to some ceremonies, and, and, and in some kind of reality by just understanding or obeying somebody else's dictate of what it was, and being forced to believe that that other being knew what it was. So somebody knows, you know, we just believe them, okay? So we were educated like that. Then we realized that was not really properly educated. We weren't really, we were led to live a miserable life, more or less, or most of us. So we broke away from that and became nihilists became materialist. There's no soul. There's no spirit. We're just biological robots. So we're just some kind of material process that we basically are told to accept. Now, the new authority tells us you can't understand that. You just be productive within it about, according to what people tell you to do. And then, luckily, you won't be that much fun unless you learn to be one of the tellers and you become a boss. Then you might grab some pleasure, grab some bigger food or something, you got to eat more than the other ones. But then you're nothing, so don't worry about it. There's no consequence or whatever idiot thing you did because you become nothing. But at least there's no pain there. So your liberation is just to be nothing. So don't try to be liberated here. Just follow our orders. That was still had elements of that dem demented way we were controlled before. But it sort of went as a kind of weird freedom, but in a way it was a regressive freedom. It was a... Harmful freedom, actually. Harmful to ourselves, ultimately, and to others as well. So we have to... I'm sorry. That's why I'm not that popular in the world, because I don't flatter the Americans. I don't flatter our modern, the moderns. I don't flatter us. We have to, to, in order to change our ways, change our way of life, change the way we're destroying our life basis, our planet, and each other, we have to admit that we are backward and we have to find something. We have to learn more from others who didn't destroy the planet, who didn't conquer us. Okay, We conquered them because we were more ruffian than them. 
And these are people from India, basically. A little bit East Asia, but an Asia in general, but actually India is really the one. The cultural civilization, and it's so, our situation is so dire right now that even the Indians have their nuclear weapons and they want to make money and they want to burn oil and they don't want to like use the sun, which they have in plenitude in their country to live on, to live their energy system, even though it's cheaper than burning their coal and their oil, but they're still doing it because they are too much us. We have brainwashed them that we are superior and our culture is superior. We, our sciences are better and they are not. So they are damaging their, their own country will be completely dried out and boiled if they keep it up, if they don't go back to their ancient way where they didn't disturb the planet, actually. They didn't go out to conquer the planet. They didn't follow Alexander the Great's example after defeating him, and even in those days, and go back and try to conquer Persia and Greece and Arabia and Egypt. They didn't bother. They were happy in India. So it's India, actually, that I promote here. <laughs> More than Tibet. Tibet is just the attic. It's the holy attic of India. But that's what it is. So our education in Euro-American culture has not solved the problems of our suffering. But that's not, that, that means we need more education. And the, here's the three higher educations, OK? And it's not, don't worry, it's not a religious thing. And once we get that education, we can find those teachings because Jesus tried to give them to us. Many of our great philosophers tried to give them to us. You know, they, they are there present in, because we are human. Even though we were nasty colonialists and we genocided lots of people, we're also human. And we're also nice. And we also have fun. And we, and, and we can also enjoy our planet. And the people we genocided, even native people here, they're still one-tenth of them are here. There are maybe 100 million of them we killed. But there's 10 million left. And they're ready to work with us and live with us. And we give them a little more freedom, let them share with them after we rob them of their whole territory and kill them, nine out of ten of them. They are still they're ready to be friends. Okay? Because the human beings are basically friendly. Like even you can be friends with your enemy. We could be friends with Putin. Little Putin. <laughs> Putin. Monsieur Putin. We could be friends with him if he would stop killing us and killing our friends, the Ukrainians. They'll be friends with him. Don't worry. Don't worry. Dear Yuval Harari was so worried. I, he's so sweet. I love that man. And he, when they started invading in February of 2022, he was so sad. He said, this will plant seeds of bitterness for decades and generations. No, it doesn't have to. They don't forgive. The, even the, the, the descendants of the killed, of the murdered, of the destroyed, they, they can forgive. They can live in the present and the future. They, can, they don't forget the past. And they see the example and they realize they could be doing that. They are but for the grace of, I, there go I. They know this. So they don't really hate the evil if they know they have a dark side themselves. And their super education teaches you that. Then you look into it. You find that. Then you control it. Then you don't act out on it. Then you become truly ethical. Then that's real ethics. OK. OK, the educational speech of our materialistic culture is too unrealistic. That's what I was saying. But I was being a little ruder than I am in writing. But I should be more rude in writing. And maybe my unpopularity would make me popular. It discourages us from understanding, persuades us that we cannot understand, indoctrinates us and traps us in absolutisms and nihilisms. We have to become more self-aware and critically minded. And we will thereby easily see that ours is still a backward culture in some respects. Our worldview puts us in the awkward position of seeking knowledge of a material universe, a frighteningly infinite mass of quantities, the knowing of which involves counting and measuring them only, which is obviously an endless effort and therefore a hopeless prospect. <laughs> Although it's not hopeless because we discovered dark matter and dark energy, which is no more real, though, than bright matter and bright energy. And the real one is transparent matter and energy, for which I demand a Nobel Prize from the Swedes someday. I do. I'm sorry. I know. But it's really, it's on behalf of, I would, I would accept it on behalf of Buddha. 
Not that I really discovered it, but I'm the one who's making it discoverable in our backward culture. Transparent energy, transparent matter is what is controlling the bright and the dark matter. And, it, and we control that by being good because that is totally good. Dark matter and energy is not really necessarily good. We're scared of that. We're scared of bright matter energy. Bright matter energy means to us supernovas, blowing up universes. Dark matter energy means being crushed by, by asteroids. <laughs> That's what it means. Making the bright matter energy into flailing out galaxies. But transparent matter and energy doesn't have to destroy anything, doesn't have to create anything, but can be used by those who feel they are all created to fix up where they are and by discovering its reality. So transparent energy can be trusted, can be loved. It is love. How about that? How about fitting science in with some love? Where love becomes rational. How about that? As well as irrational, sometimes for fun, irrational. But it's not rigidly rational, not absolutistically rational. It's transcendently rational. Aha. So it's an endless effort, and therefore a hopeless prospect for science, materialist science, to become aware of all reality is hopeless. It ended up in a pit of dark matter and dark energy, which they can't see, so they can't figure out how it works. <laughs> but they imagine that's the absolute, because they always, that's the thing, you see. When you're a childish and you think that some other thing is absolute control of you, whether it's God or it's matter or it's dark matter or bright matter or supernovas or atom bombs or somebody, when you think, or, or Trump or Putin or Xi Jinping, when you think somebody, something else is controlling you in an absolute way, then you keep projecting that on everything. And then you think, well, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's absolute. So you become a nihilist. So you sit and that's because you think you can go be one with nothing. And then you'll be set free from suffering, at least. You give up trying to be eternally blissful. You know, orgasmically joyful in all circumstances. You give that up. And you're willing to give that up when you're in pain because you want to get out of the pain. So then you buy the idea that nothing is the absolute. And then that's so self-contradicting, it imprisons you in, in disrespect of speech, actually. You then disrespect yourself, because when you say nothing, it doesn't mean anything. When you say something, it doesn't mean anything. So you're in an utter paralysis. And you create a hell around yourself as a nihilist, actually. Our worldview puts us in the awkward position yeah, I put that in a hopeless prospect. We are told that true wisdom is impossible, and so it is presented to us as tantamount to resigning ourselves to our inability to understand what we really are, what life is, and how we should live. I'm sorry, there are certain Buddhists among my beloved Buddhist colleagues in America, for example, or in Europe, or here, there, even in Asia, and they think, oh, the ultimate knowledge, the ultimate enlightenment is the gorilla. I don't know anything. Oh, I don't know. That's the ultimate enlightenment. Is he goes, <laughs> by misunderstanding the deep, profound, cognitive dissonant, tolerant, and promoting reality of enlightened beings who have said sometimes, well, I know by the mode of not knowing. And what do they mean by that? What they mean by that is, I know through experiential union, I know through communion with, other, with objects of knowledge, where there's no subject-object dichotomy, by not knowing as a, separated, as a separated subjectivity some sort of objective thing that is separated from my subjectivity. So I don't know it that way, and by not knowing it that way, I know it by being one with it, by, by being in communion with it, with all life, with infinity, with everyone, with everything. I know everything by not knowing it in some separated way. 
Because, of course, if you know infinity as a separate object and you're the sub subjective thing and it's something other than you, then you're not infinite. You can only know infinity by being infinite. And that's knowing by not knowing. That doesn't mean you go around saying, I, I don't know anything. As if, as if there's something else to be known. No, that's full knowing at the same time as not knowing. Okay? I'm afraid they don't get there. And they short sell themselves. They, don't, they should upsell their enlightenment by really working a little harder at it and realizing there is a truly transcendent way of being relational and being truly transcendently interconnected with everything. Okay, that's Shariputra not thinking they are in nirvana later or in the past experience, but recognizing they're in nirvana filled with everybody else and everything. And they are one with it all. They're in communion with it all. And that makes it blissful. Even empathic to others not feeling blissful. And then they are useful like a Buddha. Okay. Okay. So we have no alternative but to fit in with whatever orders we happen to fall under. And this is supposed to be okay since it all doesn't really matter it all comes to nothing at the end of the day. This is just what I said. No wonder we become depressed. Since in our heart of hearts, we sense that it doesn't matter. That everything, that, I'm, not, no, I'm sorry. And since in our heart of hearts, deeper, we sense that it does matter. That everything matters. And that there is more to it than not giving up, than just giving up the quest. There is more to it than just giving up the quest for being here now transcendently at the same time. Not being here now having given up that there's anything beyond here and now. That's false. And that's refuted simply by trying to find what is here and what is now, even following Descartes on that. The here point, the absolute point of being here is not there. <laughs> the absolute time of being here now is at no time. So we're always only in past and present. We're always only just not quite here. So we have to be those two simultaneously. Totally here and now, not being here and now at the same time. That's blissfully being here and now, even without denying others suffering or even our own sort of participation in their suffering we don't deny it but we overwhelm it by the blissfulness of being infinitely here okay because that's the way it actually it is clear light because it's all it's all transparency everything is transparency transparency is bliss infinite interconnectivity Okay. That's really cool, actually. It all comes to the... So, so, so. Luckily, there are enlightening, enlightened beings, enlightening beings. Now, I love from Tom Cleary. I'm, never gonna, I'm trying never to say enlightened using a past tense, although it's all right. But the emphasis is, is, by, is on presence. So enlightening. Always put it as a gerund. Bodhi, you know, some Buddha. You know, enlightening beings. So luckily there are enlightening beings, Buddhas, awakened to reality and blossomed into meaningful abilities to help, whether Buddhist or whoever else and whatever else. You know, there's that doesn't mean Buddhas have to be Buddhist. Buddhas could be Christ. Buddhas could be Krishna. Buddhas could be Einstein. You know, you know, Tchaikovsky, Beethoven, <laughs> Buddhas could be, Mozart. The enlightening speech of such Buddhas is realistic. It is scientific speech, which can often verge on the poetic. Because true scientific speech is always aware it's only hypothetical. Because the real thing, the experience, the experimental data, the experiential data, 
the one, the communion, merging reality knowing is kind of poetic because it knows that words will never be adequate to the communion itself. But yet they, they bring you to the vector, they bring you to the threshold, they bring you to the razor's edge of the experience, on the other hand. So they're immensely valuable. It isn't that they're useless. They're like poetry. They're poetic. Hypothesis is. All, every poem is a hypothesis, aware of its limitations, that is to say. Since reality is ultimately inexpressible, it is also aware of its effectiveness in generating the experience of the inexpressible, which leads to positive transformation, frees us from negative conditioning, and opens our way beyond our assumed limitations. All super educations rely on speech to direct the mind. And finally, the body, when the mind becomes really fully powerful, it can create the body. Wonderful. Then another heading. The core curriculum of the Enlightenment Buddhaversity. <laughs> Enlightenment Buddhaversity. It's being created in Bodh Gaya now. Just to show it didn't die. In India, the whole of the Buddhist educational tradition resulting in the great Indian Buddhist universities, monastic universities of Nalanda, Vikramashila, Wallabi, and many others, was based upon the realistic worldview and the realistic life motivation that comes from it. These fall into the realm of philosophy when philosophy is recognized as the original foundation of science. It, it is. Not, not absolutizing metaphysics, no. Actually, modern philosophy has gotten past me absolutizing metaphysics, yes. Except they're stuck in one last form of it, which is absolutizing nihilism. That's where they went too far. They got nihilistic. They thought they landed as a discovery in nihilism by discovering the inexpressibility of things. They thought, therefore, if it's inexpressible, it doesn't exist. So everything you say under erasure, but all that is so brilliant. Derrida, Wittgenstein, they're wonderful. But unfortunately, because of the materialist subliminal grip of our culture, they became nihilistic a little bit. Not in their heart of hearts, of course. And therefore not in some asides and some pithy things they say. And, in their, and they're still powerful in their critical stuff. But there's still, there is a metaphysic. There's the metaphysics of clear light. There's a metaphysics of transparency. There's a metaphysics of tolerance of cognitive dissonance. So a metaphysics that's poetic and hypothetical at the same time. That's, that's the metaphysics. And therefore, in that way, philosophy is the foundation of science. And all scientists should be fully trained centrist philosophers or idealist philosophers or realist philosophers or something. Really, really skilled at the theories that underlie their interpretations and their expressions and the, and the underlying caveat that's always there in any expression or any theory, even mathematical, even anything in the mathematical language, that is under erasure, that it is hypothetical, that it is not final, that it is simply handmaiden of experience. And that would make them all yogis. All scientists would be trained yogis and yoginis. Luckily, oh yeah, I said that. So they're ready to help, whether Buddhists or whatever else. The enlightening speech of such Buddhists is realistic, scientific speech, which can often verge on the poetic, aware of its limitations since reality is not remaining expressible. Oh, I finished that already, I'm sorry. The core curriculum of the Enlightenment Buddha, Buddhaversity. The whole of the Buddhist educational tradition resulting in the great Indian Buddhist universities of Nalanda. Oh, I read that already. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The Indians, foundation of science, right, there we go. The Indians, Chinese, and Persians know this and knew this themselves and built their civilizations on it. And the Europeans also followed this definition, starting with the Hebrews and the Greeks. They did, but they still... Too much absolutized. Well, like the Hebrews, for example. They, they, they knew they were absolutizers. So therefore, 
their name for God was unpronounceable. That's a deep philosophical, non-dualistic idea. If you can't name it, then you can't express it. So then by them, God is clear light. God is, you can't make a symbol of it. They made them aniconic because they knew the human absolutizing thing, but then absolutize that stone carving. So you know you can't have an object out there that you think that's God because you won't, you know, the golden calf, you know. So they were total non-absolutizing metaphysic people and they were great scientists too. Maimonides, you know, Rabbi Akiva, all these people were tremendous scientists. And the great ones in their heart of hearts still are. And same with the Greeks. So, but then, but then they, they didn't get clear. They didn't quite express it well. They didn't have a toll road to India. They didn't go, they weren't good yogis necessarily. They didn't learn how to bring the body into it. They, didn't, they lacked, because some of them did actually, but their political authorities were too, were too, uh, tended to be too authoritarian. And so they didn't tolerate people who were like completely open and free. And they would kind of persecute them. They would kill off their, their mystics, they call them mystics. They wanted to hide their insight into freedom, into equality, into relativity. So therefore, whereas India, the, many more of them got away with being yogis and sadhus and siddhas and things, because the economy in India allowed those authorities, they had a surplus. If they didn't have more mystics, they might have more revolutions for more people seeking freedom in a political way and overthrowing their governments and things. So they purposely supported their mystics. That was what gave India the edge. Why India in the Axial Age was the leader and why now discovering India is critical to the East Asian people too, not just only to us, them too. They did. They, they really, by, by, by accepting Buddhism into their culture, but then when they accepted into their culture, they re absolutized it in their own particular directions too much. So they need still to discover India. Because India, you know, in the modern period, they do need it. And they want it, actually. The core curriculum. So the whole of the Buddhist educational tradition resulted in that. Okay. The entire Buddhist tradition is both, is built on a philosophically scientific foundation, which is a way of realistic intellectual understanding opening out into an experiential encounter with reality at its deepest level. That's who your top scientist is, your Buddha. They have communion with the nature of the world. That's someone like, that's why Einstein, he was a Buddha, actually. Therefore, he came up, he came with theories that found relativity from a patent office. He wasn't in a university in the science department at first. He worked in a patent office. Couldn't get a job in a scientific university because he wasn't going into the dogmas of the theories of the day about ether and all this. He, he, made, he, he made his connection to reality out of a patent office and then wrote these papers, mailed them. I'm probably At first, they probably, who was this idiot from a patent office? Einstein. Stonehead, no way. <laughs> Einstein, one stone. All right? So the Buddha popped up from surprising places within the scientific thing. Isn't that fun? So opening it, so we, because he opened out into experience. Remember, all his things were thought experiments. Those were like yogic things. He was a meditator without realizing it, without having the posture. Realism is the key to understanding how education affects one's multi-life evolution. What a sentence. Realism is the key to understanding how education affects one's multi-life evolution. Woo! Otherwise, contemplative experience without realistic understanding could result in one becoming trapped in seemingly divine and highly seductive altered states beyond that of the human, and therefore less apt than a human to achieve the superior freedom of nirvana wherein nirvana is experienced non-dually as the actuality of the world. It's really quite good. Any enlightenment-oriented curriculum, for example, that of the new Nalanda University in India, 
should be based on the three super educations of the Eightfold Path. That's what's being built now in Bodh Gaya. And the upshot is that once liberated in the reality of freedom, one comes to see the beauty of the world, the joy of living as a resilient being, compassionately interconnected with all sentient life. Such evolved and enlightened students break free of arbitrary limits to their curiosity and then naturally launch into the specialty sciences known nowadays as physics, biology, psychology, botany, and so forth, and the many arts such as literature, medicine, law, engineering, politics, diplomacy, and computer science. Those are arts. <laughs> I don't even understand this myself. I wrote it, but I don't, but it's so good. Any enlightenment, I think actually I'm going to stop here because this paragraph is blowing my mind. So I'm going to do it in the next session. And I gave you a lot in that earlier session. I don't care how many pages we did or didn't do. So I'm stopping in the middle of page 60, even without a heading. And I'm going to start again about this, any enlightenment, enlightenment oriented curriculum. All right? So I think it's been about a little bit less than an hour, which is as much as you can take in one thing. I think one reason people don't like my books is so much is packed into it nowadays in my old age that it's like too much. So then the mind goes, <laughs> they get glassy. <laughs> That's why it's really good. I'm doing this reading. I think it is really good. I'm going to get it on Substack somehow. Finally, I think. All right? Are you there? Engineer, my editor is Adam Poison, the ir irreplaceable engineer. So credit to him. And now we're ending this. We're dedicating the merit to becoming Manjushri. All knowing, that means. All teaching, all knowing, all learning. Manjushri. Gentle glory, that means. Finding the gentle glory of transparency as reality. We dedicate to becoming like that so as to quickly be able to help other beings join us there in that freedom from suffering. And being Buddhas themselves, not to lord it over them, not to be a big boss or a big professor or a big this or big that, but to make them equal as quickly as possible. So we're all the same there, enjoying life in transparency of body, speech, and mind. That's our dedication, okay? <laughs>